All right, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. In order to be successful for today's instruction, you need a whiteboard, you need your focus, and your study guide. We are moving quick today because you have a two-page focus and a two-page study guide. And the more I do in class, the better, excuse me, the better your life is. Okay, so friendly reminder, on Monday, you have vocab 11 through 20. Tuesday, uh, 20 through 20, it's like 21 through 30. Yeah, this is great. And then, uh, of course, on Wednesday, your focus, your study guide, and your outline are due. You have a half an outline, your normal amount, so it's not that bit bad. However, it is dense content. Okay. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the dude who started the conversation of personality? Who's the dude behind it all? Who is it? Hayden. Sigmund Freud. On your whiteboard, you are born with what? It has three of them. You're either an easy baby, a slow to anger baby, or one who is terrified of everybody. Emerson. Temperament. Temperament. This is a unique and relatively stable way in which people think, feel, and behave. What am I describing? <coughs> Good. And personality. personality. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when we value uh, the value judgments of a person's moral or ethical behavior? This is how you judge the world, between what is right and what is wrong. What is that? Sophia? Yeah. Character. Okay. Sigmund Freud lived during what time period that was super repressive and sex was absolutely not discussed. What is it, Curtis? The Victorian era. The time period is important because you need to understand why it was such a big deal. Talk to me after class. You're fine. I'm, you're not in trouble. I'll just have a question. On your whiteboard, if I ask you what you had for dinner last night, and you're like, um, I had chicken fajitas with no tortillas or cheese. So I had chicken, chicken and onions. But that pause means it's coming out of your what, Jessica? Preconscious. <clears throat> when you secretly root against one of your friends and you constantly hope that they epically fail, but you would never, ever, ever admit that to someone, but you love seeing your friends fail. Where does that information live? Good. Grace Mary. Unconscious. You're unconscious. And then right now, you're a little hot. And you're hungry. And this heat is making you a little sleepy. And you're now, like, fully aware of just being uncomfortable and AP psych. What is it? Kelly. Conscious mind. Your conscious mind. Your conscience is located in what part of your personality? Id, ego, or superego? Your conscience <coughs> is located in what part of your id, ego, superego? Emily? Superego. Superego. On your whiteboard, what part of your personality, id, ego, or superego, has the pleasure principle? Good. What is it? Lindsay? Id. On your whiteboard, please tell me what part of your personality is based on the reality principle or just trying not to get bullied. Good. Madison. Ego. Ego. On your whiteboard, what part of your personality is controlled by the libido? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it? Annalise. Id. On your whiteboard, please tell me what part of your personality actually makes the decisions of what to go with? Whether sometimes the angel or sometimes the devil. Jalen. Ego. Ego. On your whiteboard, when you have the little cartoon angel on your shoulder, it represents what part of your personality? <laughs> Hayden. Super ego. Super ego. When you have the devil on your shoulder telling you to do it. Do it. It represents the what, Ian? It. it. That's your, all of your animalistic impulses. Food, sex, water, all that stuff, like anything. You're like, ah, oh, I just want it, so I don't care about the consequences. 
Okay, and that's all it. All right. On your whiteboard, there are five of these total, and it talks about the sexual development of children. What am I referring to? You missed a big day yesterday, Connor. <laughs> you didn't watch my video, though. Clearly. Guess what you should probably do? Catch up. Yeah. Some girls might have been period before you know how the other world history class watches your videos. The other world history like, class? Mr. Like, Nottingham doesn't need to do Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, I thought it was funny. Yeah, they, I, I'm very popular. Huh? You should make them pay. No. You should make them pay you for your videos. No. What do you got, Jalissa? Psychosexual. psychosexual stages. What is it called when you are stuck in one psychosexual stages? Like all you gum chewers. You're, you're what? Camden. Fixation. Fixation. On your whiteboard, what is the first stage of... Freud psychosexual stages. There we go. What is it? Curtis. Oral stage. All right, here we go. This is where we left off. Is that correct? Okay, so yesterday we got to the psychosexual stages. The first stage is the oral stage. That is when little kids derive sexual pleasure from putting things in their mouth, which is why they enjoy breastfeeding, why they put everything into their mouth. They're constantly chewing thumbs, all that stuff. You do need to know that their primary conflict is weaning, that's stopping breastfeeding, and the id is dominant. What does that mean? That they're doing whatever they want. If babies want food, do they care if it's 1 o'clock in the morning? 2 o'clock in the morning? No, they're going to do it. Just put it on my desk. Okay, so that is the first stage. So next to oral stage, you should have number one next to it. Okay, so your second stage is the anal stage. So next to anal on your paper, you need to write number two because you need to be keeping these in order, ladies and gentlemen, because there is a question on your test that asks you what is the correct order, and you just need to know. Okay, so the second stage of the psychosexual stages is the anal stage. It goes from one to three, which, by the way, this is also on your uh, focus as well, and it does require the times, like the ranges. So you may want to write that down on your focus as well. It is where the anus is the erogenous zone. So erogenous means is where they derive their sexual pleasure from. That is where they get the most <coughs> enjoyment from. So the source of conflict is toilet training. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you right now that little kids do not cry the moment they poo or pee in their diapers. They don't. They sit there happily in their mess when it's warm. It is only when their pee or poop gets cold do they cry. So if they don't cry a moment, like they, like for instance, if you pooped your pants right now, you would immediately be like, oh my God, this needs to be gone, yes? Like, could you imagine the pure embarrassment and just the, just the death you'd want right there, right? Okay. I don't know if we all did it at the same time right now. It'd be funny. I don't think your humor matches up with most people. If everyone does it at the same time, that'd be quite a bonding experience. All right, think about it. Like, were we just talking about, like, conforming? It wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, no. no. Is everyone th no? The whole school would turn <laughs> against us. Can we agree? <laughs> and everyone was like in this room. Oh my god, Connor, I'm not. I'm not okay with this conversation. I'm genuinely uncomfortable. I like that you're using my content against me, though. I do appreciate that. I do appreciate that. Anyway, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the anal stage is that babies enjoy pooping. They do. They really do. They do not cry when they poop their diapers. They only cry when the poop gets cold and starts making them cold and pulls from their uh, temperature. Okay? That's the only reason. They enjoy sitting there in their mess. So, looking at it that way doesn't make kind of sense. Little kids do not enjoy toilet training. They don't like it. Why? Because one of the only things little kids can do is what? Poop and pee. And so not being able to control, like being able to decide when and 
when and where and how, little kids really don't enjoy that because it's one of the few things they control. And that is why I think there is something to this. Now, am I saying that they derive sexual pleasure? Like, oh, I'm going to poop my pants right now. Yes. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that, but can we kind of see where he's getting this information from? And it makes some sense. I'm a skeptical, but I'm like, okay, it's not the craziest thing. Okay, this is when ego develops, and that's a huge component of it. Little kids at this point are starting to see that when they poop in the potty, it makes mom and dad really happy. When they poop in their diaper, or just like poop or pee in the bed, it makes their parents really sad. Okay, so... You're starting to see that they are starting to make decisions. Well, if I really would rather poop in my diaper, but it makes my mommy so happy when I poop in the potty, they will like, Mommy, look at me, as like they're sitting on the potty pooping for the first time. And so like you're supposed to be like, when you have kids, you're supposed to be like crazy excited for toilet training. So, no. <laughs> Especially with a boy. I already told him to cry. He's in charge. <laughs> I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> okay, so what happens if you get fixated? Who here has a dirty room at home? It, like, it's gross. Like, you have clothes everywhere. You have things cluttered everywhere. I know. I know it's not two of you. You people are disgusting because you are just teenage kids. Okay, so apparently, Jessica... That if you did not go through your toilet training with any ease, that you hated toilet training, and that you really struggled with it, you're now a dirty person who keeps their room chaotic because you're upset you cannot poop in your diaper anymore. <laughs> That's what Freud thinks. You're a messy person because that mess gives you comfort because you're not allowed to have your own mess anymore. True, not true. When your mom or dad yells at you for your dirty room and you're like, why do you care? It's mine, right? Why do you think little kids get annoyed when their parents get mad they poop in their pants? Why do you care? It's my mess. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what Freud's saying, is that the reason why you're making a mess is because um, you didn't get that satisfaction from keeping it clean. Anal retentive, I know you all have used that expression before. When they say anal retentive, they mean your anus. They mean your butt. Like you are super, super anal. Yes, you've said that. That is that you have so much focus on being neat, stingy, and stubborn. These are people who have been shamed into potty training too quickly and they feel dirty so they have to keep everything perfect. That their parents were too harsh when they were potty training and have made them into like germaphobes, I have to keep everything organized, everything has to be done correctly. Yeah. Anyone here? I'm kind of, I'm a, some things I'm in or talking about. <laughs> Emerson. She just doesn't want to acknowledge it. It's fine. Okay. So, do you get it all? Okay. Okay. So, these are people who are really good at paying attention to details. They are very organized. Everything is done to a perfect T. Every I is dotted. Every T is crossed. Everything is absolutely perfect at all times. Because if it isn't, it drives them absolutely insane. They embrace toilet training too quickly, too hardcore. And the other ones, they, they hated it. Okay. They hated it, and that's the only way they can show assert some control. All right, then your third stage is the phallic stage. So next to phallic, I would write number three. Your third stage is your phallic stage, and this is from, excuse me, three to six. So on your focus, I would write three to six in that box, by the way. Just to make it easier on you for later. Because I don't necessarily need it on your study guide, but I do need it on your focus. So your phallic stage is when a child discovers their own sexual feelings. This is when little kids play doctor. 
I'll show you mine if you show me yours. On the playgrounds, yes? Hello? You've never experienced, you've never heard of little kids doing this? Yes. Little boys look under your little girl's skirts and little girls are looking at little boys' privates and they're like, what's that? No? Yeah. There you go. It's like super common. Like, it is super, super common. Okay, this is when you start getting, uh, asking questions like where do babies come from? Why, uh, you know, do I have what mommy has or do I have what daddy has? Those types of conversations. And that's when you start talking about, like, the difference. Between, and this is when you start having the conversation of, you know, privates and keeping it to yourself and stuff like that. This is when you start having, uh, start, it's not shame. It's not shame. I don't want to say shame. But when you start teaching kids to be like, you can't just, like, you just can't be naked all the time. You can't just be running around with no pants on. Like, you know, you've you got to keep clothes on. This is when we start kind of pushing those types of things, okay? Uh, and this is the time that you really start talking about uh, who gets to, like, see you un, uh, undressed. Like, for instance, like your parents, obviously, you know, you would explain to your little kid, like, me and your dad can see you undressed because we're helping you get dressed. But, you know, if, if like, someone else besides me your mom or a doctor, the doctor in the room wants to see you undressed, there's something wrong. You know, that's when you start having like these big conversations in order to help protect your kid. That's when they're starting to become aware of different parts of their bodies and all these other things. Sophia? Um, the primary conflict is going to be, uh, it doesn't necessarily have um, a conflict. They are the complex, it's uh, attraction, it's sexual attraction, and we're going to get to that in a second. The conflict is sexual attraction, which we're going to get to, let me get there. Okay, you need to know the superego develops. That's when you start saying, well, I shouldn't be doing this, I know I shouldn't be doing this, and that's when you start having that guilty conscience. That's when little kids are like, mommy, I did something, and they start tattletailing on other people, Yes. That's your, their conscience kicking in. Okay, the Oedipus complex. Enjoy dinner tonight, friends. Okay, the Oedipus complex is part of the phallic. This is when a child develops a sexual attraction to the opposite sex parent. So ladies, they believe that you are sexually attracted to your father. Don't worry, man. You're attracted to your mother. Okay? During this stage, between the ages of three to six, you will notice little girls are all about their dad. Correct? They want to hold their dad's hand, and sometimes, like, dads take their daughters out on dates where it's just the two of them, and they go get ice cream and stuff like that. It's not like a sexual thing, people. Don't be perverts. But it's about spending time with their daughter, yes? Okay? Dads do that. They do father-daughter dances. I'm not making this sexual. I'm just telling you that like, these are certain things. Um, oh what? We did this at yeah. yeah, that's so. During this age, I'm not telling you it's sexual based. I'm not saying like like you're like oh yeah, dad. I, I'm simply saying during this time period between the ages of three to six, your opposite sex parent is very important for you to have in your life. You crave, if you're a woman, if you're a girl from three to six, you crave your dad's attention because you just, you need that attention. All the boys in the room from the ages of three to six, guess who your favorite parent was? Your mom. Every time you went out, you held her hand, you would hug her, hug her kiss her, cuddle on the couch. After the age of six, guess what you stopped doing? You probably stopped doing that completely. Now... That happens naturally. Am I telling you that it's because you're sexually attracted? I don't believe in the sexual attraction component, but can you see where he's coming from? Yes? Okay. Think back to your ages of three to six. Who were you the closest to? Ladies, you were probably closest to your dad. Can we agree? You're a daddy's girl. All the boys in the room, you were probably your mama's boy, right? 
followed her around, held her hand all the time, thought that she told her she looked pretty all the time, all those things. I'm not trying to make it sexual because I don't believe it's sexual at its core, but this is where Freud is getting his evidence. And you can see where... Yeah, the times do match up. I just don't believe, like, yeah. I think it's more just like the development area, but you can see that it is an interesting. Now, the kicker of it all is if you are a female and you, during this time period, you were closer to your dad, you did have more resentment towards your mom, which is going to come back later. That resentment is going to create jealousy. So as you get older, this is when you start having, like ladies in the room, this is when you start having issues with your mom. Freud says it's because you're frustrated that your mom gets to have sex with your dad and you don't. <laughs> okay. Now okay. I understand why his daughter's not talking. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is when you start having issues with your dad. Because... Your dad gets to have sex with your mom, and you don't. What if your parents are divorced? What Freud says. I'm just kidding. There's a whole lot more of the complexity to it. And keep in mind, Connor just asked me a great question. He's like, what about if your parents are divorced? Guess what Freud never had to deal with? Divorce. Divorce is from the 1800s. You're not getting a divorce in the 1800s. So that's something his clients never had to deal with, so his ideas of what would happen are different because we don't know because that wasn't a thing. Today, is it a thing? Absolutely. Does that affect our relationships? Absolutely. Does it have an effect on our development? Absolutely. So I don't know what he would say because that was never a problem he faced. Like the idea of people getting divorced would be like the craziest thing. So I don't know. Okay, and then you have identification. Okay. Identification is when children from the ages of three to six try to be like someone else to deal with the anxiety that they have from their sexual attraction. Guess what ages you're more likely to play dress up? Three to six. Boys and girls. So, you're more likely to dress up and act like someone else in order to get the attention you crave from your same sex, opposite sex parent. How does that make you feel? Is dinner going to be weird tonight? Nice. No. Good. Just don't talk about it. Uh, yeah. Huh? There's pros and cons. There's pros and cons. This one conversation would be a definitely pro to avoid. What do you got? Nice. So, identification. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> identification is when we try to be like someone else in order to get the attraction, uh, the attention we want from our opposite sex parent. Which is why little girls get all dressed up, okay, and they they come over and like, Daddy, look at me, Daddy, look at me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please let me stress. Like, I think this is honestly innocent, and there's no sexual pleasure. But Freud says there's like a sexual component to it. That's Freud. But can we see that it is based on a little bit of reality? Hello? We can agree, I hopefully, probably not the sexual component of it, but we can at least see that component. And then your fourth stage, which I would write four next to latency, by the way, is latency. Latency is during the school years in which the sexual feelings of a child are repressed while the child develops in other ways. This is you from 6 to about 13. 6 to puberty. 6 to puberty is what I would write for your date range. Okay? During that stage, you're focusing on your friend group. You're focusing on having connections, staying in touch with your peers, being just like your peers. Do we remember this time period? The most important thing to you is absolutely your friends. Okay? Like, the only thing that mattered to you in middle school was your friends. In late elementary school, yes. Hello? Okay? Maybe your grades were also important, but the most important thing was having friends. If your friends had good grades, you had to have good grades. If your friends were idiots, you had to be an idiot. Okay? So that's latency. 
So there's no sexual component during this stage. They're simply just trying to uh, develop socially. And then finally, we have the genital stage. Don't you love the names? Don't worry, when we do whiteboards here in a few minutes, imagine the responses. This is when I always get a pop in. I always get a pop in with the like, genitals <laughs> all over my kids' whiteboards. It happens every year. Charles, get this down. Genital stage is a sexual awakening, a uh, reawakening within the appro with appropriate targets. This is puberty to death. Okay, this is when you want to have sex with other people, not your parents. Isn't that kind? Well, thank God. Well, thank God is right. <laughs> you said puberty till death. Puberty till death. Yeah. The fifth stage. Yes, it is the fifth stage. Put five next to it. Thank you, Ian. I was so good about doing it the whole time, except for the last. Okay, this is when you want to have sex with other people. This is puberty till death. Okay, and you are going to, uh, yeah, that's that's it. So, the focus or the conflict in the genital stage is you have to have someone to have sex with. You have to find someone who will have sex with you. That's the conflict. So, good luck. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, your, your obstacle is finding someone who will have sex with you. So, that's the conflict. I mean, hopefully you've got some standards. <laughs> so, hopefully you've got someone that, like, crosses off something off the list. What do you want me to say? Like, you're looking at me like... <laughs> so, your focus of conflicts is sexual awareness for uh, phallic stage of sexual awareness. So, all right. Let's do board. Shall we live this? Let's do it. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the stage where the Oedipus complex occurs? On your whiteboard. What stage do we have the Oedipus complex? Come on. I got two, three, four. Luke. Valid. Valid. On your whiteboard, what stage do we have identification? What stage do we have identification where we dress up and act like other people in order to get the attention we crave? Grace Mary. Valid. Valid. On your whiteboard, please tell me, at what stage do we str I have a conflict with toilet training? In what stage do we have the conflict with toilet training? Good. Emerson. Anal stage. On your whiteboard, please tell me what stage are we... Uh, tell me what stage goes from puberty to death. What stage goes puberty to death? Good. Nina. Genital. On your whiteboard, please tell me what stage... Is there no sexual feelings, but a focus on developing socially within a group? What is it, Margot? Latency. On your whiteboard, give me all five psychosexual stages in order. Yes. Give me all five psychosexual stages in order. Charles, you do know you're supposed to be doing my whiteboards, right? Like I'm not doing this for my health. Good. What do we got? Uh, Camden. There you go. All right. Perfect. Any questions about the psychosexual stages? How do we feel about them? You're right. <laughs> Lindsay's ready to move on. I'm right there with you. However, can we agree that they make some logical sense? You don't have to agree with them. But they do make some logical sense, and there is some evidence to support it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so, right now we're on to our fourth theory of Freud. So Freud came up with pre-conscious, conscious, and uh, unconscious. He came up with id, ego, and super ego. He came up with the psychosexual stages, and now he came up with psychoanalysis, which you should be writing down. 
Psychoanalysis is the term Freud used to apply to therapy on how our brain works. <clears throat> when you think of going to see a therapist, this is what you probably think of. In the movies, when you see a movie scene where they go talk to their therapist, this is what they depict, even though most therapists are not psychoanalysts. Have you ever seen Freaky Friday? Yeah. Freaky Friday, um, the one with Lindsay Lohan and who's the mom? Um, um, Jamie. Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah, because she's the scream chick. Or not the scream chick, she's the Halloween oh. chick. Okay, Jamie Lee Curtis's character in Freaky Friday, the Lindsay Lohan one, the mom, is a psychoanalyst. So when you go, how do you know if you're in and seeing a psychoanalyst? Because it requires special certification. The only, there's only one university. I'm literally right here. Anyway, okay. So to become a psychoanalyst, you have to go through about 15 years of schooling. To become a normal therapist, you just need a bachelor's degree, which is four years. To become, it's not that much, yeah. <laughs> like just a regular like family therapist, and then you'll notice if they don't have a doctor in front of their name, they just have a bachelor's. I have three. But they have a bachelor in psychology, and I don't have much of that. But they can become a therapist with just a bachelor's, okay? Then you have different rankings, and if you're a doctor, typically, you're either going to be a doctor of psychology or a psychoanalyst. There's only one university in the whole country that teaches psychoanalysts, psychoanalysis, and it's University of Boston. Yeah, it's the only one in the whole country. So the difference when you, um, so regular therapy, like if you've ever been to therapy, uh, you go and you sit on a couch and you and your therapist look at each other and have a conversation, yes? Like you sit on a couch and you're like looking at each other or across from like your coffee table between you and they're sitting in a chair and you're sitting at a table and you're just sitting. Uh, my sister goes to therapy every single week. My sister has been diagnosed with depression since she was like 15, which is actually on the young side. Uh, so she goes and meets her therapist at Starbucks. She's been seeing this chick for like six years and stuff like that. So they go to Starbucks and they sit there for an hour and um, that's where they do their therapy session. But they sit at a table and they stare at each other. That's typical therapy. A psychoanalyst is you lie on a daybed. Of course. Why would that work? work? You're not using it. Okay, so have you ever seen the little couches that look like this? And the people lie here? See so, yeah. it. Okay, and they stay here, and they're like, Mah. and then they have their therapist sitting here. In a chair. That's pretty good. Oh, that's that good. Makes, it's just the bottom of the legs. Oh, no kidding, you've got it. They're going to wear glasses because they're super smart. Oh, they look mean. <laughs> No, he's working. He's putting his hands behind his head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His body's just a mind. That's why he's there. Okay, so psychoanalyst. The whole setup is really important to it, okay? And you have to understand the setup, which is why we're taking the time in order to do it. And a psychoanalyst, what happens is, is that you, as the patient, you are going to lie on a couch or lie on one of those day beds, okay? And you stare up into nothing. You're not supposed to be looking at your therapist. Why? Because it's all about getting your unconscious to come through. So if you're staring at someone and they're making faces as you're writing, as they're listening, are you going to keep talking or not say anything? Yeah, exactly. If you start talking to me and I'm just like making this face, what are you going to immediately stop doing? Talking. talking. So the point is, is that the patient stares off into nothing and the therapist literally just sits behind you in complete silence. That's so weird. Sorry. Literally. Like you walk in and they're like, hey, Olivia, how are you? And Olivia lies on the couch, and he's like, she's like, Bennett, I am not doing well. And then she just goes on for an hour. 
talking about whatever the hell Olivia wants. Am I saying anything back to her? No. No. She literally just talks. And then I'm sitting back there, supposed to, in my head, they fall asleep. You know what I mean? Like, they're just like, this is so boring. Ah, and they fall asleep because you'll never know. But they sit there and they take notes. Then, once you leave, they go through and analyze everything that you said. Now, this weekend, while you're with a friend, like a good friend, see how long you can talk without interruption. <laughs> and see, like, keeping, like, a quick pace to your conversation. Like, you know, start talking about whatever happened in your day, and you're going to spiral into some really weird shit. If you try talking for 20 minutes straight, like, set a timer, and you have to keep a quick pace. Like, so I did this, then I did this, then I did this. You are going to start talking about the randomest, craziest shit that you can recall or things that you want in the future. That is what Freud is looking for. That weird stuff. So it's going to start with, hey, how was your day today? And Olivia's just going to get on the couch and tell me about her day. But then she's going to start spiraling into other things. Freud says that is her unconscious coming forward. Have you ever done that at like 3 a.m.? Yeah, of course. Oh my god, when you broke the screen, the bedding is dark. Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, I guess I'm done? Yeah. One second. We have one. What? She's a psychologist for transplants? Yeah. That is probably, um, so there's like, t there's like eight different types of therapies. Yeah. So she's probably behavior-based therapy, where trying to take care of it, and probably humanistic. Huh? Where by taking care and nurturing the soul of a person, they improve that person. So that's probably her. There's tons of different types. Very few people are psychoanalysts. Because the schooling is so regimented, because you have to be able to decipher... Like, if I say reindeer in a story where I'm meant to imply a dog, yeah. the psychoanalyst has to be like, she said reindeer, reindeer represents this, and she really means this and stuff like that.